in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm actually going to start by reading the last two verses of chapter 4. This is God's holy word. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. You alone have the words of eternal life. You are the author of our salvation, the giver of all truth. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to us from your word and write your word on our hearts. For we need to hear from you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our bodies. That's what Paul's talking about when he talks about this earthly tent, the tent that is our earthly home, our bodies. Our bodies are, are, are funny and strange things, both wonderful and frustrating at the same time. We sometimes have a bit of a love-hate relationship with our earthly bodies. Our bodies are, are marvels of divine engineering. The human eye is a wonder in terms of what we can see and how well we can see. And uh, unless you have one of those like really high dollar advanced smartphones with like the multiple cameras on it, you know the experience of seeing something that was just breathtaking and wonderful to your eye and you take a picture of it and you're just like, well, that's not what I saw. You know, why can't they make this thing, you know, perceive it as well as I perceive it? Well, because your human eye is something that no amount of engineering money could ever put together because it is so wonderful. I read earlier this week that we can see up to a million different colors. I, I think that's only women, actually. I think guys <laughs> can't see more than about 15 or 20. But apparently we can see up to a million different colors. And... We can see depth and light and shadow and motion. It's just wonderful. The human hands are just wonderful. If you've ever been aware of the work that's been done for years in prosthetics to try to replace the human hand, it's a reminder of the marvel of engineering that is our human hands, capable of 
such fine dexterity. Watch someone playing classical guitar or playing the piano. There's this, oh, I can't remember her name now. I forgot to write it down, but there's an 80 or 81 year old woman who's a, a, a virtuoso classical concert pianist and she's still playing and she's fantastic. Like how amazing her hands are at 80 or 81 to be able to still go and, and uh, play the piano in, in such phenomenal ways. Uh, we can, and then you see that we are capable of great strength with our hands as well and great force. The same hand that can tenderly uh, touch a baby and, you know, pet a kitten can also deliver a knockout punch, you know, or can swing a hammer, a sledgehammer. Our hands are wonderful. Our human hearts, right? You know, our human hearts beat at a rate of approximately 100,000 beats per day, moving about 2,000 gallons of blood per day through about 60,000 miles of blood vessels that you have in your human body. Take just your blood vessels and stretch them end to end. They'd wrap around the earth two and a half times. The human mind. The human mind is capable of learning and remembering an almost infinite amount of information and memories. The memory capacity of the human mind is believed to be nearly infinite. The problem is being able to access all of those memories reliably, right? But there's with good reason why David said in Psalm 139 about his body, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet, when we think about those memories, we realize we do have a retrieval problem, right? Our mind holds all this stuff and yet so much of it that we'd like to be able to access, we can't. And so much of it that, frankly, we don't really want to access, our, brain, our brains keep accessing over and over again. Our eyes, as wonderful as they are, they fade as we get older, right? And we start having to carry reading glasses with us. And we have to start, you know, stretching out our arms. You know, I was able to put off reading glasses because God gave me really long arms. And that helped me for a long time. But... You know, and our hearts, our hearts, over the course of an average human lifetime, our hearts will beat 2.5 billion times. But then they will fail and they will beat no more. So we live in these bodies that are wonderful, but are also fragile and bodies that we also love and hate. We feed and clothe and care for our bodies uh, Paul is able to instruct husbands in Ephesians 5, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And yet, while we do care for our bodies, all of us probably have things about our bodies that we would gladly change if we could. That's why... Cosmetic surgery is a multi-billion dollar industry. The worldwide plastic surgery industry is worth over $50 billion because there's parts of us that we just don't like. We're this contradiction. We're beautifully, fearfully, wonderfully made and yet fragile and frail and broken and we both cherish our bodies and hate our bodies well, in the opening verse of 2 Corinthians 5, Paul describes our bodies as tents. And he was a tent maker. He was a leather worker. And tents in the ancient world were made out of leather. And so he knew how tents were made. And he also knew how tents could come apart. So he said, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul knew well how a tent can come unraveled. This destroyed, the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, is this idea that at the root of this word is loosed. And um, it's, it's loosed with an intensifier added to it. So it's loosed all the way to nothing. And you think about how a tent 
could start to lose its elasticity, start to lose its integrity and just start to fray and start to come unraveled. And then it just collapses in a heap. If there's no more tension left and if there's no more integrity to it, it just collapses. And that's what happens to our bodies. Tents are not meant to be lived in permanently. Um, I, I do like a good tent camping trip. We do not go nearly as much as we used to. We've only been a couple of times over the past several years, but I do enjoy a good camping trip for a weekend or a week. Part of the reason why we don't do it as much anymore is because our tents have failed us the last couple of times we went camping. And there's nothing worse than being on a camping, well, there's a lot of things worse, but it's terrible to be on a camping trip and have your tent fail you. And the last time we went camping, it was a couple years ago, we were up at Prince Edward Island uh, up in Canada, a beautiful place, by the way, really, really gorgeous. But we were up there and uh, our brand new tent, that we thought we had tightly staked it and gotten it taut, it gradually started losing its tension as the rain was pouring down and we were off doing other things so we could be indoors. We went bowling, we went to go see a movie and we came back to the campsite to a tent full of water <laughs> and all of our stuff sitting in water. And then we packed up the tent in the pouring rain and we headed to a hotel. <laughs> because a tent is fun for a time, but if it loses its elasticity, if it loses its integrity, it's a miserable place to be. And some of us, as we're getting older, we're finding our tents to be increasingly miserable places to be, the tent of our human bodies. Um, you guys have probably heard me say this too many times, but you know, three years ago, I, you know, three and a half years ago now, I was on no medication at all. And now I have four daily medications that I have to take. And if I don't take them, I start to hurt and I start to suffer consequences because my body chemistry is out of whack. Um, and so that's the reality, right? And sometimes I go to the gym and I get a really good workout in and I feel like I've really, you know, done something. And then, you know, an hour later I can't move. And, you know, I, it's just, you get older and our tents are not permanent. Our bodies are not permanent. Many Bible scholars believe that when we come to 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is personally, 2 Corinthians is the most personal letter that Paul ever wrote. He talks the most about his own struggles and his own trials. And part of the struggles and trials that Paul's dealing with by the time he writes 2 Corinthians is the, the dawning realization that he has that he is not likely to live to see the Lord's second coming that he's going to die. And he's been sort of facing that reality. Um, you can trace this if you understand the order in which Paul wrote his letters. Uh, one of his earliest letters is 1 Thessalonians. He wrote 1 Thessalonians while he was in Corinth doing ministry about the year 52 AD, about four years before he wrote 1 Corinthians and about six years before he wrote 2 Corinthians. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he talks about the coming of the Lord in this way. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Seems like from 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul was expecting that he's going to be among those who are left alive until the coming of the Lord. And he was rejoicing in the joy of what that will be like. By the time we get to 1 Corinthians 15, he's a little bit unsure. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Still seems like he might not sleep in the Lord. He might not die, but might be changed. But now he's experienced extreme difficulty that he makes reference to at the beginning of 2 Corinthians. If you look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where we were several weeks ago, we see that Paul had had this severe trial of affliction in Asia. We don't know much about it other than how he describes it here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, he says, 
For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Something happened to Paul in Asia where he thought he was going to die. And it seems like what that did for him was get him to face his own uh, likelihood that he's going to die before the Lord returns and strengthen his confidence in the God who raises the dead. And we still see that same confidence in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 which we looked at last week, where he says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Paul's outer self was wasting away. Sometimes we don't think about Bible people as real people, but they were very much real people. And Part of why we have 2 Corinthians is, I believe, in God's providence to show us the reality of the humanity of the Apostle Paul. Paul is later in 2 Corinthians going to recount his trials and his sufferings, how he received 39 lashes from Jewish leadership on four different occasions, how he was beaten with rods more than once, how he was stoned and left for dead, how he knew hunger and distress. I think we know the toll that takes on the human body. And so I imagine that Paul lived with a good deal of pain in his body from what he had suffered for the sake of Christ. And you can hear it in this language of our outer self is wasting away. And the language here in 2 Corinthians 5 of how we groan in this tent. But the hope that Paul has in Christ, the hope that we have in Christ, makes it possible for us not to lose heart or grow discouraged, even as our bodies grow older and frailer, even as we groan, even as we struggle. The tent that is our earthly body is passing away, but the building that is our resurrection body, our eternal home, our undying, glorified, perfect body that is untainted by sin, that is unaffected by sickness, that is undying with the eternal power of resurrected life. This body is like the glorious resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul describes it in detail in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says of this body, here he calls it a tent, there he calls it a seed. It's like a seed that's being sown into the earth. He says what is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that is Christ, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man, Christ, is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. But as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Amen. That is the truth. Notice that here in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul uses the present tense. He says, we know that if the tent that is our earthly body is destroyed, it falls apart, it disintegrates, we have right now a building from God. We have it. It's ours. We have a building from God, not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. How can he say that? Because Jesus is risen from the dead. He is in his glorified, exalted, eternal body, and he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And he is ours and we 
are his. We are in union with Christ by faith. And so we have a body. We have a building. We have a permanent, glorious home from God in heaven. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ who will make us like himself when he comes again. Jesus said before he left his disciples in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is preparing a place for us. In his resurrected body, at the Father's right hand. So even in these tents, as they age, and they even fray a little bit here and there. And children, let me just tell you, don't make fun of your parents when they groan standing up out of a chair. Because next week, that's going to be you. We're all heading there. But we have a building from God if we belong to Christ. And yet Paul acknowledges that while... This is a great source of comfort and hope for us. We do groan in this earthly tent, verses 2 to 5. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. We groan in these bodies, in this tent. And yet, and this is an important distinction that we have to understand because I think sometimes we get confused about this. Our groaning as believers in this body is not a groaning that desires release from an embodied existence. It is a groaning that is a groaning for a better embodied existence. See, there are religions in the world that focus on a goal of just simply being released from the body. They'll use language to talk about how our souls are like a divine spark, or they're part of the essence of the divine, and they're trapped in bodies of flesh that are like cages or prison houses, and we just want to be released. And their whole idea is just of being released from the body. And even with many of them released from the burden of individuality, so you can just be you can be reabsorbed into the divine and lose yourself. That's not Christianity. That's not the gospel. That's not the hope that we have in Christ. Our hope is that we would have a body that is not tainted by sin, that is not broken by the fall, that is not mortal. We long to be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And Christ's own resurrection is the pattern for this. Even some Christians will have this confusion from these other ways of thinking that have always been prevalent in the world, and will talk in ways that almost as if we think that our bodies are the problem, right? And that our, our, our souls, our spirits are, are pure. But the truth is that we were made in the image of God, body and soul, that we are fallen in sin, body and soul, and that we will be redeemed by Christ, body and soul. And we know there's nothing inherently sinful, evil, wicked about having a body because the Lord Jesus took on a body. And when Jesus was incarnate in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he took on true human flesh, he didn't become sinful. He didn't become evil. He didn't become... He was holy and undefiled and pure. And then, after he had paid for all of our sins in his body on the tree, he rose again on the third day in a glorified, resurrected body. He was able to come to the disciples and bless them and break bread with them and share a meal with them. He was able to say to the apostle Thomas, put your fingers in my wounds, put your hand in my side. He was able to cook fish for the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He had a real body and yet it was an undying, eternal, glorious, spiritual body. 
in glory. And that's the pattern that we're going to have. Because when we see him, we will be made like him, 1 John 3, 2 says, for we will see him as he is. On the face-to-face with Jesus, we'll be made into his image. We will be further clothed, not unclothed, not released, but further clothed. We'll get better clothes that last forever. We'll get a better building. We'll move out of the tent and we'll move into a mansion, a permanent home. And the guarantee we have for that, the witness that we have for that, the down payment that we have for that is the spirit, according to verse 5. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. While Jesus is in heaven preparing a home for us, God the Holy Spirit is in us preparing us for our heavenly home. So, God has ordained that a home would be prepared for us in heaven, a resurrection body, and that we would be prepared for that home by the Holy Spirit living in us and preparing us with a longing, a groaning too deep for words, to use Romans 8 language, a longing, and that the Spirit is given to us as a guarantee, as a down payment, as earnest money. That's the the word that's used here as guarantee, is the money you put down to secure a purchase as a pledge and a promise that you will pay the rest of the price in full. Now today, if you're familiar with financial transactions, you know that sometimes people put down earnest money and then they walk away from it because it's like, it's a bad deal. I don't really want to go through with it. I'll just give up the money I put down as earnest money. And so sometimes you'll see negotiations to try to get more earnest money out of people because You figure the more skin they have in the game, the less likely they are to walk away from a deal. But we need to understand that in the ancient world, people took these things much more seriously. And if you put down earnest money, if you made a pledge, if you put it on down payment, you were obligated to follow through with that purchase. It would be absolutely scandalous to not do so. And we need to further understand that the one who has given us his down payment is God who never breaks his word, who never reneges on a promise. He's given us his spirit as a guarantee. Paul said this same word back in chapter 1 when he said, all the promises of God find their yes in him, that is in Christ. That That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is two things for the believer, a seal and a down payment. The seal is that which marks us as belonging to God. We are God's own property. When you make a purchase, you get a deed, You put your name on the deed, it's yours. And then the down payment secures that financially. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. uh, Romans 8 says that we are children of God. We are children of God now. We have been prepared by God for our eternal home now by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Even as we are being prepared for that home in the future. The guarantee of the Spirit, the unshakable nature of the promise of God, leads Paul to a conclusion in verses 6 through 8 that he states twice, and that is, in the midst of all of our groaning in these bodies, we are of good courage. We are of good courage. Verses 6 through 8, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This is a a positive and even stronger way for Paul to say what he had already said twice in chapter 4, and that is we do not lose heart. If you look back at chapter 4, you'll remember that in the opening verse, he said, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And then he said again in verse 16 of chapter 4, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
We do not lose heart, he says in chapter 4, and then he says now we are always of good courage, which means even more. We are strong, we are bold, we are confident. So first he says, because of what Christ has done for us and because of what he's given us, we don't lose heart. But now he says, instead we gain a bold and a confident heart. That whatever we are going through in this life, we have a building from God. We have a home with God. We trust not just that death is not the end, not just that, oh, we go to a better place, but that we have a building from God, an inheritance that is kept for us. And that helps us to keep things in their proper perspective. When we were taking a trip to Georgia years ago, getting ready to go to Georgia again for Thanksgiving, um, and I was talking to Bert a little bit about how those long road trips get a little bit harder on you as a driver as you get older. Uh, I used to be one who would just, you know, cowboy up and just like, let's just go. We're going to drive all night. Um, and I've done that a couple of times, just, you know, all night long drives. I can't do that anymore. I hit like one o'clock in the morning. I just start, everything's blurry and I can't keep my eyes open. I don't care how much, how much coffee I've had. We just got to find a place or this is not going to be good. But the kids have gotten a lot easier to travel with. So it's, it's an irony that now that our kids are a lot easier, the kids do get easier to travel with. Years ago, we were making a trip down to Georgia. I was going to graduate school, and one of the teachers from New Covenant was going with us. And uh, she was sitting in the middle seat of our minivan, and Jeremiah was buckled into his car seat in the other captain's chair in the middle row. And he was not happy. The last two hours of that car ride, he basically screamed nonstop, miserably, for no particular reason that we could figure out. And uh, Evelyn was the name of the teacher who was there. She was so patient, and she was just trying to distract him and trying to make sure he had everything. And Beth is sitting up front with me, and Beth is finally like, okay, Evelyn, you've been a, more than a saint. I'll switch seats with you. You can come up here, and I'll sit with Jeremiah. And it was, it was just, it was some of the longest two hours of my life. Because you just, he would not stop screaming. But you realize, you know, it's not going to last forever, right? And we didn't stop because we were within two hours of our destination on what was a 14 hour road trip. We're like, okay, we're going to get there. We're going, we're going to get there. And that's the good courage that we have as believers in these bodies as we get older and it gets harder and it's more painful, we realize that means we're closer to the end. That means we're closer to the building. Yes, the tent is leaking. Yes, the seams are ripping. Yes, the cold wind is blowing in and you're wrapping the blanket around you more. But that just means you're closer to home. It just means it's almost over. So we don't lose heart, but instead we have a heart of courage. Paul here is talking about being at home in the body is to be away from the Lord, or to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Paul is not in these verses talking about the final state of the resurrected life to come. Rather, he's talking about the two states we can be in in this age, before the resurrection. Before Christ comes again in this age, in this current present age, we have a choice. Not really a choice, but we have two, two places we can be. We can either be in a body and away from the Lord, or we can be away from our body and at home with the Lord. Ideally, we don't really want to be away from a body. We were not created to be disembodied souls. But in this life, before the resurrection, we have that either we're in this body and we're away from the Lord or away from our body and we're present with the Lord. Given those options, being away from our body and being present with the Lord is better by far, far better. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. 
But that's not the final state. The final goal is not to be away from our bodies, but to be in new, glorified, resurrected bodies like we read about from 1 Corinthians 15. What Paul's dealing with here is the reality of how that hope gives us courage in this life and also what happens to believers who die before the Lord returns. Theologians call this state of being away from the body and at home with the Lord and awaiting the resurrection, they call that the intermediate state because it's intermediate between this life and the resurrected life to come. I don't like that term because intermediate state sounds really boring. It sounds like something you'd study in a math class or a physics class or a chemistry class. We go to glory. <laughs> I like that better. <laughs> we go to be with the Lord in our souls. But there is an acknowledgement that it's not, the story is not yet done until we get our resurrected bodies. So, um, many of you know that uh, my friend Dick Ireland died a couple of weeks ago now, not this past Tuesday, but the Tuesday prior, and uh, information on his uh, celebration of life is in the bulletin if you're interested in going to Chapelgate, uh, if you were touched by his ministry at all. Um, but, you know, he had a stroke, and that's why he left the radio at 63, and he then lived almost the last 20 years of his life without being able to do the thing that he loved most in life, which was to be on the radio and connect with people in that way because of the way the stroke affected his brain. And he is now at home with the Lord, but his story is not finished until he gets a new body. And in that resurrection body, he will be whole again. And, and what, now whenever I think about someone I love, like my mom who had so many medical problems and who spent so much of her life in the hospital um, and the Lord called her home uh, two and a half years ago, she's free from all of those struggles of her tent that she had, which was full of more problems than most. But she's free from that and she's with the Lord. She's in glory. She's perfectly blessed in the enjoyment of God forever, but she won't be whole until she gets her resurrection body and her resurrection body won't have diabetes and it won't have kidney stones and kidney infections and it won't have gout and it won't have all those things that plagued her for so many years. That's where we're going. And where we're going should give us a great heart of courage, but it should also change the way we look at our lives, the trajectory of our lives, what we're living for. Because if we're going somewhere, we ought to be living for where we're going and not just where we temporarily are. Verses 9 and 10. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We are stewards servants, slaves who are given charge of the master's property until he returns. This is something that Jesus emphasized in several of his parables. The idea is that we're given charge over something, but we're going to be held accountable when the master returns. We're, what are we entrusted with? Well, we are entrusted with our bodies and with our lives and with our words and with our actions. We're also entrusted with the ministry of the gospel. We have this ministry we're entrusted with the kingdom of God on earth in the church, in our worship and our service as the body of Christ. And for all of this, we will give an account to Jesus for what we have done with what he has given us. Now, he is not a harsh master, so we don't need to be afraid of that day. But we do need to make it our aim to please him. Paul says, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. A good servant wants to please the master. Wants to be able to show him something good when he gets back. Is that the aim of our lives? Is the aim of our lives to be able to see the Lord when he comes again and to long more than anything, to hear him say to us, well done, good and faithful 
servant. Now, to be clear, I want to be clear about something. This is not talking about a judgment that would either bring salvation or not bring salvation. The judgment of wrath, Christ suffered for us on the cross. And if you belong to Jesus by faith in him, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And there is a promise that you will not come under God's wrath because Jesus bore the wrath for you. The judgment is the judgment of a stewardship evaluation. What have you done? It is for the children of God who are given the privilege of serving the Lord in his kingdom. So, are you making it the aim of your life to please the Lord? Now, what Paul means by that, again, to be clear, he doesn't mean, are you living a life of sinless perfection? That's not going to happen in this life. We know that. We know that as long as we live on this side of glory, sin is a present reality and it's an ongoing struggle in the heart of every believer. We hate our sin and we love Jesus, but we know that sometimes we love our sin and we run away from Jesus like foolish wandering sheep who think that the grass is greener and the other pasture and we go astray and the good shepherd pursues us and he brings us back to himself again and again. We know that. So it's not talking about sinless perfection, but he's talking about is the heartbeat of your life, is the trajectory of your life, is the desire of your heart to say, I am so thankful that the Lord has had mercy on me. I am so thankful that he has brought me from death to life. I am so thankful that he has brought me from condemnation to justification. And I am so thankful that he has prepared a place for me that as this tent is being wasting away day by day, that I have a building from God. And I am so thankful for that, that I'm living for that building. I am living for the one who has saved me. I am living for the one who has redeemed me to please him, to serve him, to make him known, to know him and to make him known. Is that the trajectory of our lives? Because if it is, then when he comes and we see him face to face, we will be able to lay everything he's given us charge over at his feet and say, here, Lord, is what you've given to me. Take back what is rightfully yours. And he will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And on that day, the struggle will be over. The groaning will be rejoicing forever. And all shall be well for all eternity. And the hope of that day should give us every day good courage and a clear purpose for our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. You're so good and so kind and so generous and so faithful. We don't deserve anything from you. We've done everything to deserve your judgment. And yet you give us love and mercy instead. You give us peace and joy instead. And you have secured for us a resurrection life that will be with you, free from sin and sorrow and suffering forever. We thank you for that coming day. We thank you for our risen Savior. We thank you that we have a building from you, not made with human hands, kept in heaven for us. Help us to live each day in this tent as those who are on a pilgrimage to our eternal home. Help us to live each day in this life for the life to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.